Like something that won't spy I'm, I'm, I'm still everybody out there Get down with me Like something that won't spy I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Now I clown around when I hang around with the underground girls he used to frown say I'm down when I come around. The first music video that Tupac is in introduces him as an exalted luminary figure who is elevated above all others. Literally, he is honorable and distinguished, divine and radiant, dressed in the regal of a warrior or an imperial ruler reminiscent of the decor of the political rebel Tupac Amaru. This is the symbolic entrance of the Black Messiah, created by COINTELPRO, who would rise from the depths of poverty, reach a status of acclaim, sway the masses into following his lead, control public perception, and guide them down whatever path he follows, akin to a redeemer. This is the introduction of Tupac Shakur to the public, the debut of the divine black messiah, hip hop's prophet, leader, and noble prophesier. The symbolism of his entrance tells a very important story and ties into the messiah symbolism of his Tupacalypse Now album cover. One must remember that after the civil rights countercultural revolution, COINTELPRO formed a social engineering program in which they sought to create the newest black exemplar and messiah who would dominate public perception and use his status to guide the newest generation of the youth while simultaneously misguiding them. COINTELPRO had already established a series of covert and illegal projects conducted by the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation to infiltrate and disrupt multiple factions of the black community. They needed to create a vessel that would covertly terrorize the community but have all the attributes of an actual messiah, prophetic, trustworthy, and wise, who would deceive people into thinking that this figure is a civil leader rather than an agent of an intelligence organization. This is where all of the Janus symbolism comes from. Janus has two dualistic heads on his one body. Tupac, who is one person, played two dualistic roles as the protagonist and the antagonist, the hero and the villain, and the victor and the victim. This black messiah would be no hero at all, but rather an alphabet agency asset used as a source of destruction would be leading the opposition the enemy's way. One of his personas would be self-destruction, while the other persona would be benign and helpful. This video shows us one of the two sides of Tupac's, the determined, rebellious, and helpful messianic activist. His other personality was the self-destructive thug who comes out in full swing later on in his career. So we move on to his next video. His next song, Brenda's Got a Baby, is the continuance of the Black Messiah and the wise, sensitive activist. He's benign, he's helpful, he's alert, and aware of the hazards and troubles of his community. And he is seeking to utilize his humbleness and virtuousness by reaching out and offering assistance to the black community. This video presents him as a literal prophetic figure. He's speaking on the perils of living in the ghetto, He's loved by his community and supportive of the black youth and doing everything to demonstrate that he is a figure who can be trusted and leaned upon during a time of need. He's standing in front or leading the group of black men standing behind him, which only goes that he is the prophet with his loyal disciples trailing behind him. He's the teacher with his students faithfully being guided by him. He's the wise and anointed voice who has been given the foresight to help lead his community from itself 
back into harmony. If my homies call is all about him reminding us that he is trustworthy, dependable, honest, responsible, faithful, and loyal, which once again plays into the concept of him being a hero or a black messiah, because these are all attributes that messiahs have. They are leaned on upon hard times. He's saying that no matter how others perceive him, he'll always be there for them and never judge them. In this sense, he is akin to a religious leader because he expresses a compassionate nature of redemption and forgiveness, just like a religious prophet. This is yet another continuance of the Black Messiah and the divine hero first introduced to us in the same song video. Trapped a part of being an influential religious figure or historical leader is to have some facet of your life or career where you have opponents or enemies who are intimidated by your efforts to help and seek to tear you down in order to stop you. That is in fact the most corporal part of being controlled opposition, making it appear as though the system is trying to tear you down in order to give people the impression that you work against the system rather than for it. That's what Trapped is all about. This song epitomizes controlled opposition. In this song, he is controlling the opposing narrative, speaking of a manufactured opposition designed to look like a true opposition in which he talks of the police harassing him, of the system brutalizing him, and the government working to keep him and his community down. This is all to build him up as the black messiah who has begun to get targeted by the feds. All messiahs become crucified by their opponents. This video only set the stage for his inevitable assassination in which the voice of the generation was finally silenced. Trapped was all about creating the narrative of the black messiah getting torn down by the public and about him opposing the government when in reality, he fully supported them. Mr. Shakur, you say whether you classify yourself as He fully supported them. Man, damn, I'm getting in that van. That's why you get no pictures. That's why you get no pictures. My people that buy my music should understand that we have a wonderful judicial system in this country and it works and I have to go through the system just like everybody else. It doesn't matter what, we can all be in the same position at any given time and put you on court and make you fight for your life. So we move on to his next album, the Strictly album. His next album is all about introducing the thug side of him and then trying to redeem the thug side of him. Holla If You Hear Me is the first song and it is all about him rebelling against this oppression that he has experienced in his previous video, Trapped. This album introduces the other side of Tupac, the rebel outlaw miscreant. This is the other side, Tupac's and of Bishop, the side that wants authority, respect and power controlled opposition always begin to speak out against the system through controversial subjects to generate attention from the public. The main purpose of the controversy and rebellious act is to attract enough attention to get people's interest in order for the public to hear the intended message and react to it and then form an opinion. Wow. This guy is going to get himself killed by talking about how corrupt the establishment is and begin associating them with a controversial nature. He's leading us to believe he is a threat to the establishment or that there are advantages to us listening to him, giving us the idea that he is fundamentally opposed to the ruling powers, but in reality worked for the same slave master he claimed to oppose. You down, I get 
I Get Around is the debut of the contradictory and Janus nature of Tupac. His previous songs speak of supporting women and respecting women, but in this video, he glamorizes objectification and exploitation. This is the debut of the thug Tupac, the senseless, careless side of him that is a complete adversary of his activist character, the sexual deviant, the miscreant, the reckless, uncontrollable outlaw. But in his next song, Keep Your Head Up, he completely changes his tone. This switch is the hallmark of his dualism and his Janus nature in which there are two contradictory personalities displayed throughout his music catalog. He ditches the thug persona and reverts back to the black messiah and saying all the right words to negate attention from his previous song. He is trying to rebuild up his image as the sensitive and loving character that he was introduced to us as. Now, he is telling women to be strong and to never allow themselves to be used, exploited, or objectified, which contradicts how he portrayed women in I Get Around. In his Gemini nature, his personality completely switches from one to the other. The songs from this album mirror what occurred in real life in his career. He is branded as a thug and tries to rebrand himself as an activist by playing on his listeners' emotions and distract them from his thuggery to make him gather more support from his lady listeners. This whole album set the stage for the next scripted event, the fake rape case. Papa's song is an attempt to recover the messianic imagery and make his audience forget of his more recent encouragement of bad influences and behaviors. Here, he's trying to reconnect with his black male audience through a story that many black men can relate to. Single parenthood, growing up without a father, or having an abusive father as a child, etc. In this sense, he is playing with the audience's emotions because he is making them choose sides. Which Tupac should they like? The one that tells them to act recklessly? Or the one who tells them to be sensitive and benign? His split nature only continues. Repeatedly, he jumps from one personality extreme to the other. I was very aware of the fact that when you'd see Tupac approaching you, that one of my first thoughts would be, I wonder how he's gonna act today. Because he had these different, to the extreme personalities where I would like see him maybe do an interview and he'd be talking about like some, you know, some social issues and, and things that were really important to him in the black community. And I'd be thinking like, this guy is really like intense about these, these issues, right? And then another time you see him, he'd just be like, cigarettes, Hennessy and blunts. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of this, like, I have a dual personality, I'm going to kill the old me, and that goes into a lot of symbolism and fucking funny ritualistic shit that we might not even want to get into here, but, you know, I just, to, to the viewers, watch out when you see all these uh, artists acting like they got two different sides to themselves. There's other shit behind that, but anyway. There's other shit behind that, but anyway. On to his next album, Me Against the World. Pay attention to his songs from Me Against the World. They are all about building him up as the activist again, as someone who is tired of being misunderstood by the media and is fed up with being mistreated by those he had once trusted. These songs methodically coincide with the scripted hoax events going on in his real life. He is accused of rape. He is set up by his best friend. He is shot five times. He is neglected by his record company. And he is thrown in prison. In real life, the Black Messiah has begun to get crucified by the media and by the public. This was all an intricately woven storyline to set the stage for his downfall and his inevitable murder. This album planted the idea into the public's collective mind 
that the government has begun targeting Tupac and trying to find ways to ruin his life. It gives people the impression that he is a prophet because he predicted that turmoil was headed his way before it happened. Albums I've put out, it was a prophecy. This album, Me Against the World, was made before I went to jail, before I got shot. And all I'm talking about is going to jail and getting shot. Mm -hmm. So it was a prophecy. So when the album comes out, then you hear about what's really going on in my real life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have to say I'm keeping it real. You can listen to the music and go, whoa. You know what I mean? He said that. If I die tonight, mm -hmm. he said that. Um, and I'm law where I said some dudes in a mask coming to shoot me. I, I said it, you know what I mean? And, and um, it ain't easy. I'm talking about being in jail. You know what I mean? And the judge not letting me out on bail. I mean, I said all of these things and then it happened. Dear Mama was a subterfuge and a song of complete deception to give people the idea that Afeni was a role model and or hero and is the one who can be attributed to any of his successes. This song was created to get his listeners to sympathize with him. It's all lies and a story that sets people up to feel bad for him, cry with him, and love him. That way, when he is killed, it will traumatize and emotionally stunt the public and his listeners. It's to get people to believe that his mother is a respectable and dignified person and, more importantly, to cover up the truth. It's the same as the story about his dad meeting him for the first time in 20 plus years in the hospital after he was shot and then embracing each other and the same as what his song So Many Tears is about. So, on his All Eyes On Me album, there's a complete absence of the revolutionary. How Do You Want It is glorifying pornography. Two of America's Most Wanted is glamorizing the gangsta lifestyle, etc. This album is about promoting drugs, violence, and all the things that you'd least expect that hero introduced in the same song video to encourage. The dichotomy of this complex dualistic good guy versus bad guy role that we see throughout his work was purposely rendered by someone who they knew could embody polarity, doubleness, biformity, and duplicity. And that was Tupac Shakur, the Gemini. It's written in his name, two pox. His entire career consists of him endlessly flip-flopping from the miscreant to messiah persona. The I Ain't Mad At You video was a form of predictive programming relaying of what was to come on September 7th, 1996. This video represents the death of the character Tupac Shakur and the rebirth as the physical man continues to exist as a new person. Mind you that this video was shot in April of 1996, released the day after his fake death was pronounced and is also the last video released under Tupac. All subsequent material released after this is titled Under Machiavelli. This in and of itself represents the death of Tupac Shakur and the birth of the alias Machiavelli. Machiavelli is the cunning and sneaky alter ego who constantly spoke of doing everything in secrecy, this is the person you hear on the Seven Day Theory album who repeatedly talked about how his life and death had been planned out and give us a hint that his character's death was approaching. This is exactly what it means to be Machiavellian, manipulating and scheming on others to advance one's own aims. In this video, Tupac Shakur died, but lives on as a new man, 
one of clarity, fortitude, and calamity. He has been reborn into black Jesus. The white that he is wearing represents purity and rebirth. He has been renewed, shed of, and cleansed from his thug persona and molded into a messianic revolutionary for the people. In this video, just as in real life, he becomes a mythologized martyr figure after his death. He has now maneuvered his way from a hot-headed thug to a prophetic visionary for the black community. In the video, he is surrounded by Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Bob Marley, and other so-called black revolutionaries. Post-mortem, he becomes a hero for the black community, a prophet missed by many, and a man of God who was murdered by one of his own and halted from his mission to lead black people into unity. The beginning of the video follows the same synopsis as the MGM Theater Vegas incident. The video begins with Tupac and his friend coming out of a theater laughing and appearing to have a good time. Suddenly, there is a man who abruptly appears from the corner and begins shooting at Tupac. We hear screams in the background and suddenly an air of confusion takes over. This parallels Tupac and Suge exiting the MGM theater excited and amped up from the fight when they are later impaled in a line of fire as bullets are aimed at the BMW and injure Tupac. Just as in the video, Tupac is shot up while the friend is not hit at all. Notice how Tupac is the only one who is hit and not the friend. This exactly mirrors how in the fictional Vegas shooting story, Tupac was the only one shot in the BMW while Suge missed all of the bullets. We can hear people screaming in the background, but we never see them. In other words, we never see any witnesses to the shooting, just like in Vegas. The shooter, whose identity is concealed, appears out of nowhere as a mysterious, shadowy figure dressed in black and fires the shots, aiming directly at Tupac and no one else. This represents Orlando Anderson, who at the time was unknown and unheard of, with his identity also cloaked and hidden. Orlando popped out of nowhere in this Vegas storyline. He had no publicly known relations to Death Row or Tupac at the time. He never gave detailed accounts on who he was and never explained why he was at the MGM in the first place just as how the shooter in the I Ain't Mad At You video is suddenly introduced into the storyline, we have no background on who he is, what his motive is, or where he came from, he's just there, ready to kill. Just as how we had no background on who Orlando was, or why he was at the casino, he was just there, ready to kill. The shooter in the video is dressed in black, the esoteric color of death. The number 13, is the esoteric number of death and rebirth, which Orlando infamously wore that night. The shooter in the video was meant to represent Orlando Anderson. The EMTs are trying to resuscitate Tupac and save his life, but they notice that he is not responding and he is going into Code Blue. Code Blue is exactly what they claim Tupac went into at the hospital in Vegas. They claimed that in Vegas, he was in cardiopulmonary arrest and that doctors had to perform a series of resuscitative efforts to get him breathing again, but they couldn't. Thus, just like in the video, doctors cannot save him and he dies. That the, patient's DOA. the EMTs are getting no breathing response from him and pronounce him dead. Once he is pronounced dead, the video cuts to the scene of Tupac dressed in a white suit in heaven surrounded by other prominent black messianic public figures. This person we see in the video is the same as the Black Jesus Crucified on the Machiavelli album cover.
This aligns with the death on September 7th and 13th in Las Vegas. Tupac's role was completed on the 7th, and when he was pronounced dead on September 13th, the media transformed him from a hip-hop artist to a heroic messianic leader for the black community who was killed off and silenced before he could start a revolt against the government and lead his people. Once Tupac was pronounced dead, both in the video and in real life, he was suddenly morphed into black Jesus. Through death, he now garnered the image of a prophet for the black community who was crucified and murdered by his own people like Jesus before he could fight against the government. It was only after the death he became black Jesus and a savior for his community, just as the video depicts. Now we see Tupac in the back of the car with his friend, Shug, with police lights in the background. This represents Tupac and Suge in the BMW at the scene of the crime of the shooting in Las Vegas. Suge, the friend, is now mourning over the loss of Tupac. He is not seeking revenge towards the shooter at all, just as in real life. Tupac, AKA Black Jesus, is here to console Suge and let the world know he has moved on to bigger and better things, that he is now in heaven and that Tupac Shakur is gone. When the video ends, we never see a funeral for Tupac. Instead, we see the friend consoling the mother. Just as in real life, there was no funeral. Just stories of Suge consoling Afini, stories of a private ceremony commemorating Tupac, but never a public funeral or a public gathering. There is no closure in this video. We don't see the shooter getting caught or imprisoned. We don't see the family and friends gathering to celebrate his life. We don't see a tombstone or anything of that nature. It ends on a vague note denoting that there is more to the story. Another case of predictive programming. I gave her everything she my heart Come with me, hell Mary nigga, run quick, see, now, wanna ride or die. Hail Mary and I Wonder If Heaven's Got a Ghetto are all about death and resurrection, which ties into the numbers 7, the number of death, and 13, the number of rebirth. The death of Tupac Machiavelli and the rebirth of his essence into an entirely new persona. I Wonder If Heaven's Got a Ghetto was purposely created to generate a conspiracy of him faking his death to flee the Illuminati, hence why it starts on September 14th, the day after he died with a helicopter landing in a desolate location, and also to leave behind a trail of questions to keep him relevant. Was that him in the video? And so forth. In Hail Mary, the tomb says Machiavelli 1971 to 1996, meaning that Machiavelli, the character, died, but not the physical man. Otherwise, his real name would have been on the tombstone. I definitely believe that was done intentionally to show that only the persona of Machiavelli is gone, not the person playing him. The name of this album was titled The Don Columinati Seven Day Theory. The word Don is from the Latin word Dominus, which means Lord or Master, and Illuminati means enlightenment, inform, light up, make light, illuminate. So, strangely enough, in literal terms, the album title was referring to Tupac as the Lord or master of killing or destroying enlightenment. But I, I, I think that, f for instance, hip hop. Hip hop has done more damage to black and brown people than, than racism in the last 
10 years. When you, when you find the youngster, a Puerto Rican from the South Bronx or a black kid from Harlem, who has succeeded in life other than being the one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent that make it in the music business, that's, that's been a success in life walking around with his pants around his ass and with, uh, you know, visible uh, uh, tattoos or, you know, it's, it is this whole etho. At some point, those guys have to cop to the fact that by encouraging this distinctive culture that is removed from the mainstream, they have encouraged people to be so different from the mainstream that they can't participate other than, you know, uh, the racks and the garment center and those entry level jobs. And I, I lament it. I really do. I think that it has been very destructive culturally. Many people have walked away with different views on Tupac. His music and life were filled with contradictions. On one record, he would praise women, on others defame them. He would voice his concerns about crime and violence in the inner city and later release a song such as Hit Him Up, glorifying it. In interviews, Tupac often seemed like a misguided young man. Throughout all of this, the primary message is that one person played two dualistic roles. Janice has two dualistic heads on his one body. The number of Janice and the Phoenix, they're the same, is 7 and 13. 7 is the esoteric number of completion, fulfillment, perfection. 7 represents death, the death and fire which destroys the imperfection of dualism, the two heads of Janus and the Phoenix. 13 is the esoteric number of rebirth, the Phoenix obtaining a new life by arising from the ashes of its predecessor, the metaphorical two heads of Janus combining and renewing into one in perfect unison. The numbers 7 and 13 in his fake death, September 7th, September 13th, and the prevalence of these numbers in all other areas of his career are there because of the heavy symbolism it carries. It is the number and symbol of Janus and the Gemini. He began acting at 13. His career lasted seven years. He famously says, I'll be sure to be rich till 96, which highlights his awareness of his seven year deadline. Hell, the number two is an inverted seven. Just like how the sequence of his movies tell a story, so do his albums and songs. They tell the story of Tupac Shakur, the black messiah who was harassed, tormented, and crucified by his oppressors and then murdered for publicly speaking out against authority. And that's the textbook definition of controlled opposition, manufactured rise, and manufactured fall. That's it. That's all. Get out of here. If I'm dreaming, I'm not a dream. Let's